My name is Dennis Normile. I'll be the MC this afternoon. Um, before we get started, please join me in the usual routine of making sure that your mobile phones are turned off or on manner mode so we don't disturb our speaker. Our speaker this afternoon has a very long and distinguished career in studying the effects of radiation on human health. He is a uh, former advisor to WHO and has served in many uh, both uh, public and private capacities at various universities and advising various international organizations on the effects of radiation on human health. He is in Japan uh, to speak at a two-day symposium that takes place on Sunday and Monday. Uh, the Citizen Scientist International Symposium on Radiation Protection. I think everybody has gotten a handout on this if you are interested in, in attending. He has also just published a critique of the uh, United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation Report on the Effects of Fukushima that was published earlier this year. Uh, his critique appeared in English in the October issue of Kagaku magazine. I think, um, I think this was handed out as well. Did everybody get a copy of that? If not, it's available online, and I can give you the link later. Uh, and his um, description of the shortcomings of that report and the effort by Unscare to address the health effects of Fukushima will be the topic of his uh, talk this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Keith Baverstock. Well, thank you, Mr. Moderator, for that kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to come and present here. I guess I just, oh, I'll do it with this. No. Do you know how I make the slide go um. forward? No. With that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I want to start uh, uh, this presentation by saying a few words about uh, lessons learned from a previous nuclear power plant accident, namely the one in Chernobyl in 1986. Now, I'm a public health scientist, and I've been interested in nuclear accidents since 1971. Uh, my program at the World Health Organization in 1992 was instrumental in uncovering the outbreak of childhood thyroid cancer caused by exposure to radioactive iodine after the Chernobyl accident. Notwithstanding the seriousness of that health outcome, I would still say that the most damaging feature of the Chernobyl accident was what became known as the psychosocial effect. At its root, the psychosocial effect is about trust. Trust in the authorities whose job it is to protect public health. At the time of the Chernobyl accident, the authorities in the Soviet Union did not disclose the full facts concerning the extent of the accident at the outset. And as a consequence, they lost the trust of the public when the true situation became clear. The psychosocial effect is therefore preventable. After the Chernobyl accident, the United Nations organizations, the World Health Organization, International Labor Organization, Food and Agricultural Organization, the United Nations Children Fund, and the United Nations Development Program, and the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency, developed legally binding frameworks specifically to protect public health in the event of future nuclear accidents, both from the pathological effects, cancer, etc of radioactivity and the psychosocial effects. The international organizations, therefore, with the consent of their member states, undertook a role in protecting public health alongside nation, national programs. 
The protection framework was firmly based on scientific principles and scientific evidence. The role of the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiations, UNSCIA, although not an active party in the public health protection framework I've just described, stands in a kind of supervisory role in terms of authenticating the scientific basis for the framework. It also provides an assessment of the levels of radioactivity and risks of exposure to radioactivity following a major accident. Now, given the importance of the psychosocial effect, UNSCIA has a special obligation to be timely, transparent, comprehensive, independent, and truly scientific in this important task. My criticism of UNSCIA is that it has been none of these things, and most importantly, it has not taken a scientific approach. So I will briefly outline my criticisms under the headings I've just given you. So timeliness. UNSCIA did not publish its report for more than three years after the accident. In fact, it published it in April this year, although it is called the 2013 UNSCIA report. And then only in a partially completed form. In fact, I believe there are still remaining parts to be published. In my view, that is one of the reasons why it has taken UNSCIA so long. Sorry, it is, in my view, one of the reasons why it has taken UNSCIA so long uh, is that the United Nations Public Health Protection Framework, under the leadership of IAEA, did not function initially. Indeed, it seems that there was an interval of at least three to four days before the framework started to function. For whatever reason, the 2013 UNSCIA report was too late to be effective in mitigating any potential psychosocial effect. Transparency. The UNSCIA report fails on transparency, in my view, on the grounds that the failure of the IEA-led public health protection framework, which is at its most important in the first earliest hours after the accident, uh, is not referred to at all in the report, although it must have severely limited the extent to which the uh, risk could be uh, assessed. Uh, that an emergency framework was developed and led by the now secretary of UNSCIA. He has acknowledged to me how serious that failure was uh, from the point of view of the UN organization. UNSCIA know my views. They have seen uh, this report in its draft form. Uh, and they claim that their remit extends only to reporting on the levels and risks of exposure to radioactivity. Other aspects they regard as political or not scientific. Others may regard that attitude as being protective of the interests of other UN organizations that they might otherwise have to criticize. Comprehensiveness. The difficult part of a radiation risk assessment after a nuclear accident is to determine the doses in the very early hours of the period in which the releases occur. The exposure route here, in addition to external radiation, is from immersion in the radioactive cloud and internal irradiation from inhalation and to some extent immersion, uh, ingestion. It is necessarily an imprecise process, relying on sporadic measurements and modeling based to some extent on knowledge of the source term. Had the emergency preparedness plan worked, there would have been the possibility of international assistance to gather dosimetric data in the early days of the accident. It also appears that some monitoring data from in situ suspended particle monitors was available, but
but not used by Ansgear. One has to include that Ansgear preferred not to estimate these doses, and to this extent their report is not comprehensive, and the reader is left in a state of ignorance about the early exposures and the risks they might entail. Independence. What is crucial to a risk assessment such as that prepared by Unskier is that it is independent of those who might have a vested interest in the outcome. Here Unskier fails on several counts. Firstly, its members are nominated overwhelmingly by national governments with nuclear power programs that have high economic importance. And those same governments also provide funds to Unskier. It is clear that UNSCEAR has at least a potential conflict of interest in that it may serve the needs of its benefactors, presently 27 natures, uh, nations, at the expense of non-nuclear nations, and there are currently 193 member nations in the UN, many of whom are potentially subject to fallout in the event of nuclear accidents, without incidentally getting the economic benefits of nuclear power. UNSCEAR could have published the CVs of its members, including their publication records in the field of risk assessment, along with signed statements declaring any conflicts of interest, such as employment in the nuclear industry. This is a standard procedure for the United States National Academy of Sciences in similar circumstances. What is not notable to me as someone with a long-term experience in the field of radiation risk assessment, is that few researchers that have been critical of the nuclear industry and the nuclear lobby are involved in the preparation of the UNSCEAR report. Crucial to the estimation of doses in the early period of the accident is the so-called source term. This is the amount of radioactivity of different uh, isotopes released from the stricken reactors. As three cores melted and produced several plumes of radioactivity over more than a week, these are very important and complex sources of risk. Of several estimates of the source term available to Ansgear, they chose to use one published by the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, raising the question of whether this organization is independent of the uh, owners of the nuclear reactors, TEPCO, or any other party with a vested interest in the consequences of the accident. The Japan Atomic Energy Agency source term was the lowest among several estimates of releases. For example, its value for the isotope cesium-137 is six times lower than that of an international group. To date, the UN agencies have produced three reports on the Fukushima accident, two by the World Health Organization and one by UNSCEAR. I am told a fourth is about to be published by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. However, it would be wrong to assume that these four reports have been prepared independently of one another. At a recent international symposium in Fukushima City, a senior management staff member of the WHO claimed that the UN agencies collaborated closely in making health outcome risk estimates. So none of these reports are independent of one or the, one of the other. Finally, I come to my most major and important criticism because the S in UNSCEAR stands for scientific. United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiations. A truly scientific report, such as might have been produced by the US National Academy of Sciences, would be all the things that I have listed. Timely, transparent, comprehensive, independent of all vested interests. And so my foremost criticism of the UNSCEAR report is that it doesn't qualify as Unskier claims, as a scientific document. In fact, the report shows many features that can be interpreted as downplaying the importance of the accident from the public health perspective. I showed Unskier my criticisms before they were published, 
and they have had the opportunity to publish, as I suggested, the CVs and publication records of its members. It has failed so far to do that. So finally, just to point out uh, one example where I think it's lacking in uh, scientific rigor, I draw attention to the uh, UNSCEAR's own press release with the headline, Increase in Cancer Unlikely Following Fukushima Exposure, says UN report. But we don't have to go far into the report. In fact, to page 74, and we find a distribution of worker doses is provided for the one and a half years after the accident. A rough estimate from this diagram gives a total dose to some 10,000 workers with doses above 10 millisieverts. Uh, and using the basis of standard risk factors, this amounts to some 50 excess cancers over the lifetimes of those workers. Now that is only for the first one and a half years of the working time. Also, Unski's estimate for the total Japanese uh, population, the public collective dose for the first year of the accident is 18,000 per sievert, and that is between 2,500 and 3,000 excess cancers over the remainder of the lifetimes of those people. This is on the basis of the best, our best knowledge of the risks from exposure to radiation. And these are not unlikely cancers, but cancers that are to be expected. They may never be identified as in, in specific individuals as a Fukushima-caused cancer, but they will occur. In the same way that we can't identify cancers from secondary smoking. It would be inexcusable for a scientific body to represent its own findings in this way. So I come to my conclusion. It has not satisfied, this, re this report has not satisfied the primary requirements of a scientifically sound risk assessment. It is not timely, it is not transparent, it's not comprehensive, it's not independent of vested interests and therefore it's not qualified to be called scientific. The United Nations do, <coughs> many of the UN nations do not have uh, nuclear power generation facilities themselves, but they would suffer from the effects of fallout from those that do were the climatic conditions uh, appropriate. And they need an independent scientific assessment of the Fukushima accident and my advice to the UN would be that they should com commission one, but that they should also dissolve the UNSCEAR committee. Thank you. Okay, we'll move right into Q&A. Um, please come to the front, identify yourself. And we have someone providing a simultaneous translation, so speak slowly so she can keep up with us. Name and affiliation, please. Uh, my name is Hiroyuki Fujita. I'm a Kokubin Shimbun newspaper editorial writer. I'm not a scientist, but I'm an so associate member of uh, scientists for accurate radiation information. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Wade Allison, uh, Professor Emeritus of Oxford University, is one of the uh, scientist, scientist members. Now, according to him, for example, uh, so-called uh, uh, low-dose radiation, let's say 100 mil sievert or less, uh, not so bad for human health according to the scientific research. And all the scientific knowledge uh, root, uh, rooted on the, uh, the experiment of the fruit fry, as you know, perhaps. So your understanding of, of, or observation scientifically is uh, not valid according to, you know, the, um, let's say, Sally's understanding. So would you, would, how would you comment on this? Yeah, I can certainly comment on that, no problem at all. 
Uh, Wade Allison, do you know what his uh, scientific expertise is? Physics. Physics. 40 years. Yes, 40 years of physics. Yeah. Not public health, not medicine, not biology. So, yes, Wade Allison is a very highly respected person, I gather. He was the master of Keble College at one time. He's written a book on uh, radiation. And I did a review of that book for the journal called Lancet in the UK. They didn't publish the review because I said this book was highly entertaining and would find a place on any shelf of, non -fiction, of fiction books. It is fiction, that book. His idea that biology can be likened to, well, I think he used the fourth bridge. Do you know about the fourth bridge? The fourth bridge is a bridge across the river Forth in Scotland. And it is long enough that uh, painting it takes around four years to complete from one end to the other. So it is then necessary to go back to the other end and start painting again. So they are forever painting the fourth bridge, and it has lasted a long time. And it has withstood a lot of weather. Uh, and this is uh, Allison's uh, model for biology, that a biological system can withstand a lot of small events, but not very large ones. So painting is, you don't need to do anything structural to the fourth bridge to keep it there. You only need to paint it and then it won't rust away. But if a big storm came, it would demolish the bridge. Well, biology is not like that. Biology is much, much more complex. And uh, we don't have to rely on work on fruit flies to know what the, uh, the effects of radiation are. Uh, we know what they are on human health. Uh, we have a lot of epidemiological information, which he ignores. Uh, I think the man is dangerous. I think you are putting yourself in a dangerous position if you believe him. Uh, I volunteered to him in an email to have a debate with him in Oxford, and he didn't think that was necessary. So perhaps I think you know where he stands. He's a crank. Thank you. Okay. Further questions? Peter? <coughs> Langan at Bloomberg News. This question might be um, stupid, but I'll ask it anyway. I read, and I can't find the source again, that um, one of the arguments uh, from the, the pro-nuclear lobby is that man has evolved with radiation, natural radiation, background radiation, and hence um, the fears of radiation exposure are um, <coughs> exaggerated and that we've, as I say, evolved and, and have a natural protection, if you like, to it. Um, but my understanding, and again, this is perhaps the stupid question, during a, a nuclear explosion or the generation of power from a uh, nuclear reaction, that it creates man-made isotopes that we haven't evolved with and hence present a, another type of danger. Could you just clarify that point? Yeah, uh, I think it's true that uh, we have evolved to live in a, a, a world that has uh, levels of radiation. Uh, and what we see is that if we look at the cancer incidence in relation to radiation dose in areas of habitual high background, we don't find an excess of cancer. If you compare high background with a low back or normal background area, the high background area doesn't have a, an excess of cancer, and that might be because they have become um, adapted to a higher level of radiation. And uh, that's probably true, but it probably took 10, 20 generations. So when you, on today's generation, suddenly increase the amount of radiation, 
then the, the organisms, the people or um, animals in the, in the environment are not adapted to that. And uh, what we have seen around Chernobyl and what we have seen around um, Fukushima is damage to the wildlife. We have seen the bluegrass butterfly damaged. We have seen the swallows damaged around uh, Chernobyl. And this looks to be very much like radiation damage that we would expect if we, if we were to examine it in the laboratory. So <clears throat> I think the uh, idea that we will adapt overnight to higher levels of radiation is a false one and uh, that it will take uh, some time, maybe 10 generations, which you could see in butterflies maybe, but we're looking at 300 years to see it in human beings. Um, so I, I, I don't agree that it's relevant to, to nuclear accidents. I think it's true, but I don't think it's, it's relevant to nuclear accidents. Now, what you say about um, isotopes or nuclides like plutonium, that may well be true. I think um, there are people who, who say that uh, they, they pre present a risk for which the body has, or the human organism has not adapted. When I try and explain this, I, I use the example of uh, people arriving at an airport with luggage. The system has a limit to how much luggage it can handle. And if everybody brings between one and two cases, the whole system functions completely normally. But if one day everybody turned up with five cases, I bet the system would break down pretty rapidly because it wasn't designed to deal with every passenger bringing five suitcases. So that is the way biology works, that it spends a certain amount of energy to protect against threats to, at the cellular level, to protect against threats using very expensive, uh, in terms of resources for running the cell, in repair and detection processes for damage. But it doesn't overdo it so that you could put 10 times as much damage in. And that's why I think we have a problem with radiation-induced uh, effects, because we haven't adapted to those higher levels. <clears throat> Christoph. Süddeutsche Zeitung Neidhardt. Uh, two, two, two questions, if I may. First, uh, cattle in the Fukushima area displays white spots, often uh, near the neck. Uh, do you have any, and, and it's pretty obvious that they didn't display these white spots before the nuclear accident, so it's pretty obvious that it's in somehow connected. Do you have any theory? Uh, I mean, there must be a genetic defect, but do you have any more detailed theory how, they, uh, how these white spots uh, appear? And the second question is, we know of uh, quite a few scientists in Japan who have findings that could not be uh, published. Uh, we know one case uh, specific uh, at, the, at the MRI, the Meteorolog Meteorological Institute in Scuba. Uh, but there are other scientists, but they don't come forward. So we don't know who they are. Do you have any idea whose works have been uh, suppressed, thanks. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to say no to both those questions. I, I am not an animal <coughs> physiologist or geneticist, and I don't know why radiation should produce anything as specific as, as white spots, but um, I, no, I, I really, I would need to know a lot more, I think, and probably I couldn't answer it even then. You probably need to take that question to a, uh, a biologist in that, more in that area. And no, I, I don't know about work that cannot be published here. I haven't come across that myself. <coughs> but then I don't spend that much time here. <coughs> it's Daniel.
Hi, I'm Daniel Eskenazi, a freelance journalist from Switzerland. You uh, criticize a lot UNSCARE in uh, your report, but what do you think of the WHO that has an agreement with uh, IAEA uh, on not discussing the radiation effects on uh, humans? Yes, this agreement has, uh, this is a, a common kind of agreement that every UN agency or organization uh, reaches with all its uh, other agencies which might work in a similar area or on a, or on a similar problem. Personally, uh, I've had a lot of experience. I've worked for 13 years inside the WHO and I worked with the IAEA uh, on some projects <coughs> during that period. Um, there is no problem with working at the technical level between the two organizations. People at my level, without managerial responsibility, get on fine and we use our expertise uh, in a collegiate way. But when it comes to uh, issues of policy which concern nuclear energy, then uh, there comes a problem and it's nothing really to do with that agreement. It's to do with the fact that, um, uh, let's put it this way, on a subject like radiation, the IAEA has a lot more money to spend than WHO. And therefore, WHO's effort is bound to be a lot less. And in the upper levels of management, um, it seems that uh, WHO managers would um, agree, if you like, with the policy of another agency rather than listen to the technical expertise of their own staff. And that happens in other areas as well. And it is a big distorting factor. I don't know whether you saw there was an international symposium at Fukushima City a few months ago, two or three months ago, and the WHO spokesman there more or less said that um, the WHO had to take account of the economic aspects of nuclear power when deciding what was reasonable in terms of public health protection. That statement horrified and amazed me. It's not her job to look after the economic uh, health of the nuclear power industry. It's her job to look after the public health of the population. So there is confusion there, and it seems to persist. Um, the WHO impede, uh, the IAEA impeded the publication of the guidelines on uh, iodine prophylaxis to prevent uh, children uh, on exposure to iodine-131 developing thyroid cancer based on what we learned from the Chernobyl accident. And the IAEA, after cooperating to produce those guidelines, withdrew their support and then tried to stop the WHO from publishing them. So these are, call themselves brothers and sisters among the UN nations they fight and squabble just as normal brothers and sisters do, as well as cooperate. <clears throat> okay, next. Yes, down here. I'm an NHK commentator. I'm a commentator. え、
、えー、と彼らの,その健康管理を、えー、これからどうしていけばいいかということをまずお伺いしたいことです。あと、えーそのまあ、例えば子どもたちの場合そのその時に被爆した可能性がある子どもたちが大人になった時にがんが発症したとその時に、まあえー、どういうものを残しておいたりどういう、まあ、例えばよく言われるのがあの歯に蓄積したセ,サ、えー、セシウムを残しておけばその後にそれががんに発症した、えー、証言になるとかっていう話も伺いますしあとそれがまた質問です。また、えー、今後、まあ、日本では原子力発電所がまた再稼働するというふうに言われています。で、また仮に事故が起こった場合に、どういった緊急対策とか、えー、どういう対策を講じていくことがいいのか教えてください。よろしくお願いします。Okay,、uh, for the first question,、um, it is inconceivable that the workers could handle that <coughs> accident without. Considerable exposures and without the, con without the appropriate consequences in terms of health, and that would be、uh, cancer and possibly non cancer diseases. Also, the children, these are、um, mostly male workers, so the children of these workers should be、uh, followed up. So there should be.、Um, uh, Kind of、uh, registers, registers of、uh, people who worked with their doses,、uh, and they should be traceable through their registers. I don't think, in general, unless the exposures are very high, it is necessary to have medical supervision, only to be able to uh, uh, assess when uh, they uh, exhibit a cancer or some other disease which might be appropriate. Uh, I would say circulatory disease would be、uh, one thing to be added to cancer for the adults. The children of the,、uh, of the workers should be followed as well,、uh, and there should be a register of those and the dose that their parents received, and whether which of their parents was the worker, the exposed worker. Uh, and they should be followed for birth defects and cancers, and perhaps even other <coughs> diseases as well.、Um, and the only thing that you can do, you cannot, there is no way of looking at a person and saying he's a likely、uh, candidate to have a cancer. It's just not possible to do that until the cancer is diagnosable, until you have symptoms.、Uh, so, Cesium on the teeth is a, is a fairy tale. It's not, uh, not uh, solid evidence for anything.、Um, but it is going to be important to have those registers set up now because、uh, it becomes very much more difficult in the future to trace those people.、Um, as for the emergency response in, in,、uh, in the case of an.、Um, A future accident, of course, it is the national responsibility to maintain that emergency、uh, system. And it is a, re a national responsibility for those who signed up to it to、uh, cooperate with the United Nations and the IAEA in, in, in particular. So、uh, I would say it's a question for many national authorities, not just Japan. And for the United Nations organizations, and particularly the IAEA, to put back the wheels on the broken system that、uh, this accident has revealed. Now, I am no longer working in the United Nations system, so I don't know whether any progress is being made on that.、Uh, but I do know that in some European countries, they have been looking at their nuclear emergency response plans. Uh, and uh, appropriately modifying them in the light of what took place in Fukushima. Further questions? Yes, Kurt. <coughs> yeah, my name is Kurt Sieber, I'm an associate member.、Um, in connection with a recent drill. 
in Niigata about the uh, a nuclear power accident, there have been some differences of opinion between the governor, Izumida, who, by the way, was also here uh, some time ago, and the central government as far as the distribution of potassium iodine pills are concerned. Um, Izumida said uh, they should be distributed immediately because uh, that they can be used uh, when they are needed. The government, the, the central government said that um, they should only be distributed after an accident has happened and only in those areas which are really strongly contaminated. Uh, so um, please clarify for the benefit of the Japanese government what's the uh, co correct answer to that um, because it is generally known that uh, if you take uh, these pills uh, more than eight hours after the uh, uh, accident has happened or the contamination has started to happen, uh, the, the efficiency is going down at a very, very uh, rapid pace. Yeah. Yeah. I should like to add in this context, I'm also from Switzerland, by the way, uh, that Switzerland is just right now uh, distributing uh, iodine pills to 4.3 million households uh, with the instructions how to take them, and there is a big controversy going on because it was not the instructions were not pu published in about ten different languages. Thank you. Yes, well, I'm very glad to hear that Switzerland has finally decided to pre-distribute the tablets because that is the really only effective way of using these iodine tablets. They should be in the houses of people, in schools, in hospitals, and any place where they might be needed. They are only needed by children. They are not needed by adults. Uh, children are very many times more sensitive to the effects of uh, radiation on the thyroid than adults. So, yes, they, it is pointless to wait until the accident has happened to distribute them because uh, even the distribution process will take two to three days, even at the, the most uh, efficient. So they should be pre-distributed. They should be exchanged at least every 10 years. The population should be reminded that they are only to be taken when instructed. That <coughs> is the advice that the WHO eventually was allowed by the IAEA to publish. Uh, in the uh, around 2003, I think. So yes, it, it's extremely important, and uh, it seems that the distribution of thyroid tablets around Fukushima was sporadic, uh, and many people didn't get the benefit of them. So uh, yeah, you're absolutely right that pre-distribution is the answer. Other questions? Uh, before we give uh, people a second uh, question, I'd like to put a question. Um, you know, there is some sort of um, effort going on within Fukushima to watch for, uh, uh, to scan, to track the health of <coughs> Fukushima citizens. <coughs> to address a lot of the questions about whether whatever they find is due to radiation or from other causes, should the government have established a control group so that they can compare what happens in Fukushima with, uh, you know, and, and tell whether it's normal or uh, can be traced to radiation exposure? Did, did the Japanese government miss an opportunity? Here. Yes, I think so. Uh, we're, we're talking primarily about scanning uh, for thyroid disease, are we? I, I know that's one uh, objective. The, I, I don't know, I forget the details of uh, their program, yeah. mm. but I, I think they're more encompassing than just uh, watching for Well, there, there is, uh, but screening, I think, is primarily for thyroid. But I may be wrong about that. But 
Uh, that's, I mean, certainly there is screening going on for, for thyroid. And yes, of course, a control group is necessary uh, if the screening is uh, to yield any scientific results. If the screening is for humanitarian reasons alone, which is really to, to uh, satisfy the fears of the public, then I suppose you don't uh, need a control group. But there's always the temptation, <coughs> once you start one of these processes, be it a scientific one, then to convert it to a humanitarian one, or it being a humanitarian one, converting it to a scientific one. And we experienced that problem with the Chernobyl accident, and quite frankly, the two, the two types of project need such different things that it's not really possible to, uh, to run them both in parallel. So either you're going to do it for purely humanitarian reasons, then you are not concerned with a control group. You're, not con you're only concerned with making sure that people understand that if there's something happens, they've got a diagnosis there. In, in terms of um, science, you can't do anything useful, particularly if you implement uh, new technology, as was done in this case for the thyroid scanning. Uh, it was very much higher resolution than had previously been used for this purpose. And therefore, it may have detected things which uh, were what we call uh, prevalent in the population and not just incident. So they may have been there in, say, an 18-year-old from when he was five years old, before the accident occurred. But we can't tell that if there's just one round of screening. Now, I think with good foresight, it's been decided there will be two rounds of screening. The first round, I understand, is finished, and the second round will be starting soon. If the number of cancers increases in the second round, then there is a problem with, uh, with causation probably by the accident. But if it doesn't increase, <clears throat> then what we've seen to date is the result of uh, uh, conditions which are prevalent in the population and not necessarily incident. So they may not be associated with the accident. So it's quite complex Thing, and there are two sides to this coin, if you like. Of course, it's good to get rid of uh, disease, but it's not good to operate on somebody for something which isn't going to turn into a disease. And many of these screening processes throw up conditions which never turn out to be a cancer. For example, we all in this room have several small occult cancers in several tissues. And yet, in all probability, none of those will appear as a disease, uh, let alone a cause of death. It's just a fact that these very small cancers, which seem to be contained, are present in tissues. And uh, they don't develop into anything that's life-threatening at all. So there is no point in taking a thyroid out for one of those. And the thyroid is one of the tissues that does certainly have those occult cancers. So uh, there's two sides to the coin. You, of course you want to prevent disease, but you don't want to impair somebody's life by taking away their thyroid and committing them to thyroid hormone treatment for the rest of their lives on the basis of a something which will never turn into a disease. Uh, another, for many of the people in this room, uh, prostate cancer is another uh, example where screening can produce a lot of false positives, create a lot of damage for no good reason at all. Personally, I say no to a PSA test every time. Before we give uh, people an opportunity for a second question, is there anyone who has not asked a first question who has a first question? If not, then we'll go to round two. Fujitsu, <coughs> ah, wait. Okay. Yes, back here. Uh, 
Hello. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, unfortunately, I arrived late. I may have missed something, but I read through the notes. My name's Gavin Rees, and I'm visiting Tokyo. I work for the DART Center. We're an organization that works with journalists around issues to do with trauma. And one of the things that you mentioned was the, so, the psychosocial care and responsibility yeah. of the government. And, we've, and you've talked uh, a little bit about uh, the importance of trust as a factor in building that. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more fully um, and maybe talk about some other factors that you think are, are relevant. And one thing that occurs to me maybe of interest to people is that, the, uh, that a lot of these communities are farming communities and there are concerns about the produce, the natural environment and crops and so forth. So if you could speak to that, please. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I mean, before Chernobyl, what we now refer to as the psychosocial effect was called radiophobia, mainly by the nuclear industry. Uh, that's a very derogatory term for something which is actually a real, uh, a real problem. And it came to light very, very clearly uh, in, in the case of Chernobyl. And you mentioned them being rural communities. Of course, that was practically all the communities around Chernobyl were rural communities. And people who relied very heavily on uh, the forest and uh, the natural products from there, and to be told that, well, you can't any longer eat the mushrooms for the next 30 years is a big deal. Uh, but there's also an effect on them, I think, of feeling that their environment wasn't any longer safe for them. And what other uh, surprises might there be in store? So yes, uh, to, to go to this issue of trust, and, I mean, trust is very, very important. And it's been shown time and time again. If you don't tell the truth at the outset, people will never trust you again. Uh, that's happened in, uh, you're from the UK, I guess, mm -hmm. Camelford. Do you remember Camelford? Well, I know of it. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> so at first, uh, this was a case of putting um, a clarifying agent into the water uh, distribution system. And it's aluminium sulfate. Concentrated solution of aluminium sulfate is dropped into a huge volume of water, diluted down to a very low level, and it clarifies. It causes the water to be much clearer. Uh, the guy delivering this stuff to the, uh, the water distribution center put it in the wrong place. So almost neat ammonium, uh, aluminum sulfate was distributed to some houses close by. And of course, when people tried to make tea with it, it was not very good. So uh, initially, <clears throat> the response was, well, there's absolutely no problem, and these people are crazy, and... Uh, and then eventually when they said, well, yes, okay, well, there was aluminium sulfate uh, and it was a serious problem, and then nobody would believe them. Nobody would listen to anything they said after that. So that's the first rule, really, that, that once you break that rule, uh, you're in trouble. But there are many other aspects. For example, um, people feel that you know, they come, become sick and there's been some event and they think, well, yeah, it's probably down to that event. It's probably down to that nuclear accident that I feel the way I feel. And they go to the doctor. And the doctor, for whatever reason he has sometimes, well, he says, yeah, well, it may be that. And then you start to build up a kind of, um, uh, a kind of legends about what radiation might do to you. Uh, and this is based on the fact that doctors are not that well educated in the, not GPs are not that well educated in the effects of ionizing radiation. So they don't really know, but they say something which they think pleases the patient. So the patient then goes away and says, well, oh, yeah, I'm absolutely, I am sick. So uh, I should behave like I'm sick. And uh, then the stress builds up, and then they do really become sick. Uh, another route is through diet. Um, they decide, people decide, well, you know, the apples are probably contaminated, so I won't eat apples. And so they stop eating fruit and things which are good for them and concentrate on things which are not so good. And then their health suffers again. They, they took to alcohol and smoking. 
around Chernobyl to very high levels, and uh, many people died of alcohol effects on the liver. So this is the psychosocial effect. It's, it's actually not just, it's not simply the fear of radiation. It's actually the fear for their health in the context that they don't have the knowledge or the trust to know that their health is being protected. Yep. Does that help? Uh, it does, yeah. Thank you. Do you have time to take two more questions? Yeah, I think. I, well, uh, do we have time? Yeah. OK, <laughs> we've, we've come to the end of our hour, but uh, our guest has agreed to stay for these last two questions. Fujita-san first, and then Kristan. <laughs> Well, um, do you drive? Isn't driving bad for human health? Consequently, driving. driving. Well, okay, but, but apart from that, uh, my question is, is it justifiable to evacuate and kill hundreds of people simply fearing unknown effects in the future? Well, you know, these are not unknown effects in the future. I mean, if you're, if you're speaking to Wade Allison, tell him we're so, still open to debate. Slide, 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 with, slide. Yeah, OK. Well, uh, it's, it's not the fear of things in the future. I mean, it's very real. Uh, we know that uh, exposure to natural background radiation, most people will agree. Uh, even the National Radiological Protection Board in the UK says that 6% uh, of cancer in the UK is due to exposure to natural background radiation. This is not the fear of something imaginary in the future. These are real. It doesn't affect everybody. <coughs> Smoking doesn't affect everybody. My father smoked over 40 cigarettes a day for most of his life, and he didn't die of lung cancer. He lived to 95. So hundreds of people killed to sacrifice. Well, who, well, who are these hundreds of people killed? Where are these hundreds of people that are killed? Are uh, okay, Fujita-san, please. Uh, let's not get into a debate. <laughs> Anything further to say about that? Uh, no. Okay. Christoph. <coughs> in, a, in the first year or so after the accident, the Japanese government allowed that uh, uh, this uh, debris or, or rubble from around the, the plant could be burned when it had, I think, below 8,000 becquerel or something like that. Uh, I don't remember the number. Now, what they did then, they just diluted it with uh, non-contaminated uh, rubble and, and burned it in, in, in incineration uh, plants, more or less, all over the country. Now, from a public health uh, point of view, this obviously increases the background radiation. Do you think that was acceptable? Well, if you've got a certain amount of, uh, ra let's say, radiation dose to distribute, it doesn't matter whether you give it to a few people in highest doses or you give it to a large number of people in uh, low doses. Uh, within limits, of course, if you give it all to one person, you can only kill one person. But I'm talking about if you give it to a few thousand to giving it to a few million, um, <clears throat> then that dose uh, is in man sieverts. And man sieverts converts directly to casualties, to ca extra cancers. So by diluting it, uh, if it's milk, it doesn't make any difference. If you if you've got a certain amount of dose to deliver in milk, you can deliver it to a million people or you can deliver it to a thousand people, you'll get broadly the same uh, public health result. Dilution doesn't help. So that was unacceptable. I think it was unacceptable, yeah. It's the wrong thing to do. Okay. Last call for questions. Okay, okay, Peter. And this will be our last question. Um, having been at the uh, World Health Organization for so long, um, it'd be fair to say perhaps that you've broken ranks in terms of coming out with these criticisms of those UN bodies. Amongst scientists in your field or 
of, of similar views. Is there any kind of growing body or, of independent views that may coalesce into something that could that could be a voice uh, that better represents what you're what you're saying? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, I am rather pessimistic about uh, what has happened um, in the scientific field. And I feel that, um, I don't have time to go into all the details here, but um, if you like, the science uh, establishment has kind of conceded the ground. I mean, many of them have been bought in, for example, by the nuclear industry, but also in other areas by the pharmaceutical industry, by the tobacco industry, by the sugar industry, by the salt industry, you name it. Uh, it's difficult now, increasingly difficult, to find independent scientists who haven't been associated with those industries. Uh, because universities are funded through those uh, industries. So the very seed corn, if you like, of the scientific community is, is subject to those problems right from the beginning. And uh, what I think is, and the reason I come here to... Um, uh, these meetings is that this is a citizen scientist organization. I think that's where the future lies if this situation continues. That it, instead of relying upon the national establishment to protect public health, the population, the citizens, have got to <coughs> get involved and push and use what independent... There, there are independent scientists in the radiological field. None of them are involved in the UNSCE report or the WHO report, but they're there and they're publishing. Uh, and uh, if the media gave them more coverage, uh, then that would help as well. So there is a role for the media here in addition, but primarily citizens and citizen scientists organizations like the one CSRP, which I am uh, attending at the weekend, I think it's where the future lies, sadly. Okay, we will end on that note, that note that uh, media does matter. I'm, I'm glad to yes. hear that, actually. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> as a token of our appreciation for coming by, we'd like to give you a one-year honorary membership oh. to the Foreign Correspondents <laughs> Club of Japan. I understand you come here quite a bit, so please come back and visit us again. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and thank you to our interpreter this afternoon, uh, Yuk Yukako Ninomiya. Thank you very much, and thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming. <laughs>